presentation and the record as well is structured in two uh, sections. Uh, in the first section, we deal with the main uh, uh, relevant mm -hmm. literature on in the disciplinary research. And uh, in the second section, we present the data of uh, a mapping of the disciplinary training programs open worldwide. So we do have two uh, <coughs> objectives in this, uh, in, this, in this report. First of all, to uh, uh, um, analyze the main issues that are addressed by uh, literature on interdisciplinary research, the main problems that uh, are addressed by uh, uh, relevant literature <coughs> on this field. And then we uh, try to open uh, a window and a perspective on uh, what is an offer uh, at the international level as for uh, training in interdisciplinary. So uh, it is important here to uh, notice that these two sections are uh, strongly connected with one another. So we uh, try to uh, uh, define main concepts and issues from the relevant literature and then use these, uh, these findings to um, um, to guide and shape our mapping of uh, interdisciplinary training programs, as we shall see in a few minutes. So we can start looking at the main uh, issues that are addressed by the literature on interdisciplinarity. So first of all, uh, there is a conceptual dimension, what is uh, interdisciplinarity and how we can define interdisciplinarity. Then there is uh, an issue that is related to uh, the main uh, how to assess and how to measure interdisciplinarity. And this has to do with uh, the uh, degree of interdisciplinarity of a research project, let's say, or even a, a training program. Um, but also uh, the measurement of the scientific impact of uh, an interdisciplinary research. And finally, we uh, also analyze some of the main obstacles to interdisciplinary research in trying to assess and to evaluate which may be uh, the main hurdles to, uh, uh, to conduct a, a research, an interdisciplinary research. Um, in terms of uh, in looking at the, this conceptual dimension, what we have seen uh, is that uh, this is a concept surrounded by uh, confusion, meaning that interdisciplinarity is now used in different contexts with different meanings, and somehow it's, it's quite difficult sometimes to uh, clearly understand what this interdisciplinarity is. So we try here to provide an operational definition of interdisciplinarity, and it has to do, of course, with crossing um, disciplinary uh, boundaries and boundaries and creating bridges across uh, disciplines in order to generate new uh, original, theoretical, and or methodological approaches to uh, analyze and assess issues and problems that are some scientific or even social, uh, social relevance. And there are two aspects that are, according to us, uh, really important to assess uh, interdisciplinarity, that is the level of interaction and integration of different disciplinary areas. And based on these two dimensions, we can also distinguish three different kinds of interdisciplinarity. As someone said, uh, it, it, it is better to talk about interdisciplinarities, plural, rather than interdisciplinarity, because there are differences, and these differences are not irrelevant. So at a low level of integration and interaction across different disciplinary areas, we have what we can call multidisciplinarity. Here, different disciplinary uh, areas do not talk with one another. There is not an attempt to integrate different uh, conceptual uh, and methodological tools uh, to generate new approaches. We can think as an example, a training program uh, focused on environmental issues, let's say. Uh, these are issues that can be addressed from different viewpoints and from different disciplinary point of view. Um, in a multidisciplinary uh, training program, students will be exposed to different inputs coming from different disciplinary areas, but these disciplines do not talk with one another. So at the end, the student will have a set of tools as derived from different disciplines, but he won't be able to uh, make connections in a sense between and across these different uh, disciplinary areas. At a higher level of uh, integration and interaction, uh, across different disciplinary areas, we have what we call the proper interdisciplinary. And here there's an, an attempt and an effort to, um, to integrate different approaches, different uh, conceptual tools and um, theoretical tools as derived from different disciplines. 
at the highest level of integration and interaction, there's uh, transdisciplinarity. And here, um, something has been said previously by uh, John Aldrich about uh, transdisciplinarity. Um, it has to do with the development, uh, development of kind of holistic approach to issues and, and problems that goes beyond uh, disciplines. And, uh, and thus, it involves in the research uh, activity not only academicians by profession, but also uh, individuals, experts um, from civil society, private agency, and all those individuals who might have an interest in uh, carrying out an interdisciplinary, uh, transdisciplinary, sorry, uh, kind of uh, research effort. Of course, the combination of these two dimensions creates some problems in terms of um, how to measure the uh, degree of uh, interaction and integration. And we have seen in literature that there are different kind of tools that can be used. There are uh, qualitative tools and quantitative tools. Often these are used uh, separately by different scholars. So there are scholars who might be more interested in understanding the scientific impact or the level of uh, interdisciplinarity of a given research project, and others who might be uh, more interested in the, uh, the processes and the, um, let's say, social cognitive uh, dynamics unfolding in the uh, black box of uh, the research activity itself. How let's say, uh, individuals and scholars coming from different cultural backgrounds can uh, um, negotiate, in a sense, and create a common ground to start with a new research project and work together. Um, and uh, uh, according to uh, our perspective, we think that actually in order to have a better assessment of um, interdisciplinary research, we should look we should take into consideration both quantitative and qualitative methods, and we should look at the overall picture of what we call the cycle of research. So we should focus both on training, research activity itself, and output. These three dimensions should be taken into consideration and evaluated in order to have a better grasp on what is and how, uh, how can be relevant interdisciplinarity. So we should look at the antecedents, I would say, of the uh, research activity the processes that unfold in the uh, research activity itself, and then at the outputs of the research. And of course, this implies uh, that we should also uh, consider the obstacles to interdisciplinarity, which might be the obstacles for uh, a research and interdisciplinary research. And here we listed a couple of, um, uh, of obstacles that can be uh, really, really relevant. Uh, so we have cultural factors that might hamper uh, interdisciplinary research. And as I said before, uh, it's quite difficult to, uh, to combine different perspectives and different uh, cultural background. Uh, there are, of course, institutional factors, something that has emerged even in the previous presentation, the previous talk. Uh, <coughs> universities are organized along traditional disciplinary lines, and these might create uh, difficulties and problems within the same institution, creating an infrastructure for an interdisciplinary research. One of the most relevant problems is access to to uh, resources. Uh, there are personal factors. People might be discouraged in undertaking an um, interdisciplinary career because it's time consuming, because it's difficult, because it's difficult to publish, it's difficult to get a position in the academia. And there are, of course, procedural factors uh, that are, let's say, related, for example, to the inadequacy of traditional peer review for an interdisciplinary project. How can we evaluate an interdisciplinary project based on the traditional disciplinary peer review process of journals, of scientific journals? This might create, of course, problems for those scholars who might be interested in uh, uh, having a career in interdisciplinarity. So given this broad picture, now we uh, can move to, uh, uh, let's say, the empirical <laughs> section of this presentation and the mapping of interdisciplinary training program. And I leave the floor to uh, Alessandra. Okay, thank you everybody. Let's talk about some results, some data. So, uh, as um, David has said, we shaped our mapping based on the theoretical framework we've drawn from literature. So, basically, we uh, collected data for four different data sets that you can see IDS, MDS, TDS, and ENG. ENG stands for <coughs> integrative or integrated. And then we create an aggregated data that we called IMTI. 
Well, we collected a, a fair amount of programs. Uh, as you can see, 1,271 1, bachelor's, master's, and PhDs offered by more than six, 600 institutions in 34 countries. Well, uh, the truth is that uh, the vast majority is represented by bachelor's, six out of 10, then master's, three out of 10, and PhDs. As you can see, if we disaggregate the data by data set of origin, eight out of 10 come from the IDS data set. So uh, the keyword was interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary program. Uh, so let's talk about a few, a few interesting findings. The first one is that there's a sort of Anglo-Saxon uh, hegemony, uh, meaning that more than 80 I don't know if the Canadian would be to be part, <laughs> I do, at least part, at least, but not Quebec, but the yeah. other So uh, more than 85% of programs are offered by, let's say, Anglo-Saxon University. You can see the top 10, so United States, Canada, United Kingdom, there is also Australia, but these are the bottom. Uh, United States offers a vast majority of programs, seven out of uh, 10, then we have Canada and United Kingdom. The second ranking in Europe is Germany, with 3% of programs offered. Uh, well. If we disaggregate the data by program typology and program level, so uh, BA, Masters, or PhD, what we found is a slight different pattern. Uh, it's true that the overwhelming majority of bachelors are offered by, are offered by uh, US institutions, so uh, US, Canada, and the UK, we are about the 97%, but a lower proportion of PhD, PhDs and Masters. And if we look at data, in Europe, we can see that half of masters offered worldwide are European masters. So uh, we may suggest that the offer in Europe uh, is uh, dedicated to the graduate level, so masters and postgraduate PhDs. Uh, a second finding is uh, concerning the typology. We identified three main typologies, um, categories, I would say, of programs, um, SAP, PDP, and um, S. Uh, uh, the F, meaning standalone programs, pre-designed programs, and self-designed programs. Self-designed programs are, I mean, basically those who leave the floor for students to shape their own program, and they're concentrated at bachelor level. Then we have uh, standalone programs, ugly structured, not flexible, and we're talking about graduate studies, so masters and PhDs. What we found is that six out of 10 are standalone programs, so not really flexible, there's no room for students to shape them. Uh, three out of 10 are self-designed. Uh, if we disaggregate the data by degree level, uh, what we see is interesting. We have more or less the same percentages concerning masters and PhDs. So eight out of 10, a vast majority, are standalone programs. While if we look at bachelors, the percentage sharply decreases and only half of programs are standalone. Uh, this is in line with what we would expect from an under, undergraduate training. So trainings that are offered to students at undergraduate level, that, and they are able to shape their own program. This is not really uh, interdisciplinary per se. Uh, we did not limit ourselves to um, descriptive statistics. We try and dig deeper in uh, uh, looking at some more interesting data. And uh, we focused on two main issues. The first one is the role of disciplinary interaction in shaping the programs. And the second issue is the ambiguity of the interdisciplinary level. As far as the role of disciplinary interaction is concerned, we pose ourselves three main questions. So how many disciplinary areas are on average included in each program? How these disciplinary areas cluster together? And the, if there is any detectable pattern? And what are the most recurrent disciplinary areas? Well, to give an answer to the first couple of questions, uh, we ran some uh, uh, some analysis, so basically factor analysis and correlation analysis. And what we found is that when we talk about interdisciplinarity, most programs tend to be narrow in scope and nature. Scope meaning numbers. On average, we have on average four disciplinary areas included in each program out of 15 disciplinary areas. When we talk about nature, uh, what we found is that those disciplinary areas that concur the most to create factors of interdisciplinarity are bordering and contiguous area. As you can see from the table, we uh, extracted six main factors from our analysis. Each factor is based on the interaction of two main areas. As you can see, for example, in factor five, 
we are talking about areas that are contiguous, biological sciences and medical sciences, or factor six, economics and mathematics, or factor one of sciences, civil engineering and architecture. <laughs> what you can also see is that political um, and social sciences are not there, meaning that they do not contribute to the core factors of interdisciplinarity. So we come to the third question. What are the most recurrent disciplinary area? We pose this question because we wanted to know why PSS was not included among the areas that were contributing the mass to interdisciplinarity. And well, what we found is that the most recurrent disciplinary areas are area 11, 13, and 14, meaning that, for example, for political and social sciences, 54% of the programs we collected include at least one teaching in political and social sciences. So we may argue that the rationale behind the, the absence of PSS in the main factors of interdisciplinarity may lay in the fact that it, it, is a, so it is diluted among all disciplinary programs. So this decreases its ability to be, a, let's say, a factor of close clustered interaction between disciplinary areas. As you can see, we, we, can, we can say the same for economic and statistical sciences. So there's a high relevance, 55% of, pro, of programs in our data set include at least one teaching in economic and statistical sciences. The second issues we addressed was the ambiguity of the IDS level. So uh, based on, our, on the theoretical framework we drawn from the literature, we saw that there's a sort of typology of interdisciplinarity based on the level of interaction and integration. We also saw that this is somehow reflected in the level that university attributed to each program. So we have programs that are called integrated, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary. But we also perceived, looking at the teachings in each program, a sort of confusion. And we wanted to dig deeper about the reasons of the confusion. Well, we hypothesized a sort of problem of market positioning by the university. So a sort of mismatch, a gap between the theoretical framework and the label attributed by the university. Uh, that's why we created a sort of very simple uh, interaction index. The basic assumption be behind the interaction index is the higher the number of disciplinary areas included, the higher the level of interaction. As you can see, we can only talk about interaction because the means at the time at our disposal allow us to address that. Integration is much more difficult to address. So we focused on interaction. And so what we found, benchmarking the labeling of the university against this interaction index, is that our expectations were disconfirmed. As you can see, there's no variance between the different data sets. And more or less, six out of 10 programs in each of these data sets, doesn't matter whether they're labeled interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, or transdisciplinary, show a low level of interaction. Um, we would expect that for the multidisciplinary programs, who are expected to have a low level of interaction, we would have ex expected a higher level of integration for IDS and TDS program, and this is not the case. Of course, this kind of analysis has its own limits. The main one is that we focused on a subsample of 186 standalone master programs. So not on the entire data set, but only on master programs. But when we look at master programs or standalone, so highly structured, that's the results. Uh, we see the same level of low interaction, doesn't matter the level. So we may suggest that this gap does exist. So there is a mismatch between the theoretical framework, the typology of interaction and integration, and the level given by universities. And well, we, we would confirm that it's a matter of market positioning strategy. So it, it's more of a way to attract students more than about the actual content of training. Um, while this uh, research was focused on training, we also devoted some time on research. So we launched the, this very basic web search looking for interdisciplinary research centers uh, embedded with, within or affiliated with universities. We found more than 50 of them, and you can find detailed information about each of them in the appendixes to the report. But here we have some interesting findings, six main findings. The first one is that Mass interdisciplinary research centers are also institutes for advanced studies. So we may suggest that there may be a link between excellence in research and interdisciplinarity. A second is that this is quite um, an innovative and, research and recent re uh, stream of research. Uh, besides some exceptions, and there are a number of 
interdisciplinary research centers that has been established in the 60s, back in the 60s or the 70s, most of them have been established uh, in the late 90s onwards. Then the third finding is not particularly interesting. Uh, interdisciplinary research centers are more inclined to networking and internationalization, but this may be true for any kind of uh, institutes for advanced studies. Uh, a fourth finding, mm, interdisciplinary research is not country specific. We found research centers in more than 20 countries. Of course, there's a predominance of research centers in the United States, but then we find IDR research centers in Europe, East and Far East in Asia, for example. And then findings five and six, and this is also linked to the nature of interdisciplinary research. Uh, most of the centers we collected have this kind of thematically open <coughs> focus of research, meaning that uh, they allow for interdisciplinary research groups to conduct their research, their researches on a broad spectrum of topics. So most of these research centers are focused on humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences, and then provide finding and logistic platforms for interdisciplinary research groups to conduct the research. Then there are, let's say, theme-driven or, or cluster-structured interdisciplinary research centers. So they act as platforms where very specialized center on very specific interdisciplinary topics, for example, uh, cognitive sciences or brain sciences, they work together with others, but with some kind of boundaries although they are interdisciplinary. So as for the concluding remarks, uh, we go back to the, to the cycle of research. So basically what we, we suggest to you, and we would like to have your feedback, is that any assessment of interdisciplinary research should go back to the cycle of research. Why? Because we should think of this cycle as, as a sort of circular circuit. There are three main nodes, training, research activity, and output. So, Basically, the system is balanced if all these nodes share the same magnitude and if they transmit the same amount of energy and if the channels are the same size. But what happens if one of these nodes um, absorbs more energy than it releases? Well, it jeopardizes the stability of the system and it hinders the abilities of the other nodes to develop and grow in, with full interdisciplinary potential. So we address the first of these nodes, that is training. And the main findings, this is, this is just a, a small uh, recap. The first one is that interdisciplinary training is narrow in scope and nature. So a low number of, interdiscip on, of disciplinary areas that are contiguous and bordering. And concerning political and social science, we found with factor and correlation analysis that PSS do not contribute to any factor of interdisciplinary interaction but, and I would say maybe because, it is relatively more suitable to be included in a wider number of interdisciplinary programs. So, we may suggest the sort of dispersive effect that hinders PSS ability to develop close cluster interaction, and this dispersive effect may be generated by the presence of a bottleneck in this cycle of research. So the question is, where is the bottleneck? Is training the bottleneck itself? Is it about research? Is it about the output? Well, here we launched some uh, research recommendation concerning research. What we could do is to conduct a, an online qualitative survey targeting interdisciplinary research centers to see how they work with a focus on their projects and on the professional profiles and affiliation of the members of these research centers to see how they work and why they call themselves interdisciplinary. It's also a way to benchmark the self-positioning against the analysis of practices. As far as outputs are concerned, well, basically, we need to assess what are the obstacles to publication and dissemination. This is something that has already been addressed by literature, but I think we think that something we could do is, for example, uh, a map of scientific journals to assess, for example, the not, not the acceptance rate, but at least the number of disciplinary areas covered by this scientific journals to see whether there is some kind of parochialism that hinders the possibility to publication. And then we may also address the access of interdisciplinary projects to funding initiatives. This is something that is also related to the first node, so research. So basically what we think is that in order to assess the um, ability to interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity to be productive and effective, we need to address all these nodes, 
all together because one of them may hinder the development of the others.